speak to you tonight uh, about a desperate encounter with God. I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life when things kind of uh, come at me in all different ways, I just know from experience, I know that a touch from God, I know that an experience with God, an encounter with God can do more than a bunch of sit down sessions or more than complaining, more than anything that man can come up with. If I could just have that moment with God, and I'm not talking about recreating something that happened in the the past. I'm talking about pursuing God with the intention of touching him, pursuing God with the intention of having an encounter with him. I don't know about you, but I look back on my life and I can see that there are just some defining moments Maybe you can. Have you ever just thought back? There were just some times in your life when you can look, there's kind of a before and an after. You know, the Bible talks about some defining moments. If you remember uh, Joseph in the Old Testament, the Bible says that his dad sent him out to find out what's going on with his mom or with his, with his brothers. And, and uh, so he goes out and he's looking for his brothers to bring back a report to his dad. And he looks and he looks and he's gone for days and he can't, he can't find them. <clears throat> he was favored by dad. So all he had to do was just come home and say, you know what, Dad, they're not where they're supposed to be. I don't know where they are. And Dad would have just said, okay. And you know what, life would have went on. Life would have been just fine for Joseph. But the Bible records a defining moment. You may have missed it if you've read over because it's real small. The Bible just says that he met a stranger. He just says, oh, yeah, I seen them. They're over in such and such. And that defining moment, that chance encounter changed his life forever. It got him sold into slavery. It got him thrown into prison and beaten and left for dead. He had to go through some things. That defining moment, that one twist in history made him the prince of Egypt. The Bible says that, that David was up on a hilltop and he was just tending to his sheep. No big deal. I mean, he was kind of thought very little love in his family. His brothers were great warriors, and, and nobody really thought about him. He was just left alone on a hill, just tending to his sheep. That was kind of the lowest of what you could be doing at that time. No big deal. But the Bible says one day changed everything for him. Just a defining moment in his life. The Bible says that Samuel came along and anointed him king. Changed his whole entire life. One defining moment changed his life. It changed everything for him. The Bible says in Acts 9 and verse 1, it says, but, but Saul at the time, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and he asked them for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that they found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. If you know your, your Bible history, you know that Saul was doing pretty well off at the time. I mean, he was, he was very astute. He had a lot of clout. He had a lot of authority. He had some power. He was doing pretty good. And if you know the Jewish history at the times, he probably had a pretty nice home, may have been married. We don't know for sure, but according to customs, he probably was. Probably had a lot going for him at this time in life. I mean, he was devoting his entire life to serving God. I think about this. He was serving God thinking that he was doing all the right things. And it says, as he was on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Think about this for a moment because we know what happened for the next three days. He was blind. For those three days, Paul's probably thinking, I better find me a tin cup because I'm going to be sitting on the corner. If this is it for me, if I'm going to be blind, I'm going to lose it all. I'll be an outcast. They didn't have uh, all the things set aside for those without sight. 
It was just the corner for him. So for three days, he's thinking, man, what am I going to do? The Bible says that his name was changed through this time. Of course, we know he had an encounter with Christ. We know that there's some things that we don't even understand that was explained to him that he was shown. We know the history of all the writings in the New Testament that he presented to us. We know the churches that he established. We know the history. We know what's taking place. But think about what's going on at that moment in his life. There's a defining moment. There's an encounter with God that changed his course forever. The Bible says so much so there was a change that it changed his name. I don't know about you. But I wonder if we could possibly have an encounter so mighty, so amazing that our name would change. The whole atmosphere would change around you. They would say, oh, that's the praiser. Oh, that's the holy guy. Oh, that's the righteous guy. Oh, that's the guy that teaches now. That's the guy that preaches now. That's the guy that serves God. That's the guy that had the encounter. I'm talking about having an authentic, a pure change in life. And maybe it takes a defining moment in your life for this to happen. Maybe you've already had it. If not, then probably you will. Because it's probably being prepared for you. Or you may be preparing that moment yourself. Maybe you want to prepare. Maybe you want to have that defining moment in your life. I'll be honest with you, for me, a defining moment, not the only one, but a defining moment in my life happened about two months ago. And of course, you guys know that I'd, I'd, I'd had back surgery and I was going for a follow-up visit. I was driving to Louisville and I'm very, very allergic to non-steroid or anti-inflammatories. And I'd taken a... a, 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 a sinus medicine that had a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in it. I didn't know it had it in it. And so I'd gotten to Louisville and I was breathing heavy, not realizing what was taking place, not realizing I was having a reaction. I just thought I was having a, an asthma problem. And I remember when it got really bad because I knew I was 22 blocks away from the hospital. And so I hopped into the vehicle, had my 14-year-old daughter with me, and started zipping through Louisville. And if you know anything about the hospitals downtown, there's a lot of one-ways, and you can get turned around on a good day. So I was counting them off in my mind. I was seeing, okay, 14 blocks, 10 blocks, 4 blocks. And when I got down to around 4 to 3 blocks, I was at a point with not being able to breathe. I was ready to pull over because I thought I wouldn't make it. I really thought this was it. I was not going to be making it. She would have to call 911 and get an ambulance there, but I could see the hospital. So I jetted finally across the final block and I went around the hospital and wouldn't you know it, I missed the turn. Well, it's all one ways and there was no way I was making it all the way back around. There was no way. I could barely get air. And finally, I was driving what looked like a back street, and I saw ER. And I whipped it in, jumped out of the vehicle, and took off inside. When I got inside, I realized I was at the wrong hospital, but I didn't care. Went inside. I'm, honey, couldn't breathe. Honey, help. And the lady says, well, just have a seat right over here and fill these papers out. And I just yelled out for what I could help as loud as I could, which was just a lot of air, but a lot of security people came running out of these little booths. So I must have been pretty loud. And so they jetted me back to the back. And I'm real concerned at this time, but at least I've got these people around me. So they put IVs in both arms and they're pumping me full of this medicine and shots here and shots there and they put this mask on me and, 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 and we're hoping things are working and the, the head nurse is there and the head doctor's there and then another doctor comes in and another doctor comes in and nothing's working. And my breathing is getting more and more shallow and more and more shallow. 
and I am desperate at this moment. And it's interesting, you always heard what goes through your mind when you're on your deathbed. I don't want to sound dramatic. But some things went through my mind at that moment, and it had nothing to do with how much money was in the bank. It really, not one time did, did I see in my mind how much my truck payment was. Didn't cross my mind. The kind of house I'd like to get into, I wasn't thinking about that. A lot of things were not going through my mind, especially when I had about eight professionals standing around me and the lead person looked at me and said, there's just nothing else we can do. And at this point, I am scared. I've never been this scared in my life. I thought, okay, I got to pray. <clears throat> so I tried to pray. I couldn't talk. I couldn't pray. So I did what I've, <clears throat> I've, I've taught so many times. Sometimes when you don't know what to pray, you just say Jesus, right? <clears throat> and I remember getting down <clears throat> like this right here, with the cords and all that. Hang and I, I couldn't say Jesus, but I was just going, <sighs> Every time I could get that breath out. And I wasn't seeing any great drastic changes going on with my breathing. And I was getting really concerned. I've been teaching this for a long time. And I wasn't seeing a change. But the thing that was going through my mind, that defining moment, I was thinking about Jesus. I was thinking about my wife. I was thinking about my kids, my family. I was thinking about relationships. And, and I, you know what? I don't mean to sound hyper-spiritual, but I began thinking about those encounters that I'd had with God and the purpose that he had put in my life. And had I served my destiny? Was this it? Had I done what I had been placed here on this earth to do, or was it still inside of me? Because how sad would it be to take that last breath knowing that that purpose was still here and it hadn't been experienced. Yeah. And I remember when finally they had moved me over to the room and they were, they were prepping me to intubate me and, and something happened and a lady said, let's try this. And they put a different mask on me and it, it changed everything. I began to breathe again and I spent a couple of days in ICU. I came home and everything's fine. I do believe God touched me that night. Come on, come on. But I'll tell you what happened <laughs> since then. A desperation inside of me. Something happens, Pastor. You know, we've heard the testimony of when, it, when, when he's told you've got cancer and this is it, start making arrangements. Something happens because you begin thinking when you get home, hey, I'm desperate for God. Yeah, I know there's responsibilities, but at the forefront of my life, I've got to be desperate for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because there's destiny inside of me and I know God didn't mean for me to sit on a chair from here on out. God, God, put me on this earth to serve and to praise and to praise and to serve him. That was a defining moment in my life. And I'm not saying everything's been hunky-dory. And I'm not saying that every day I wake up and, and I'm on a plane with Jesus. But I'm telling you this, I have a desperation in my spirit to have an encounter with God. And when I wake up on Sunday mornings, I mean this with all sincerity. I don't just mean this because I'm involved in ministry. I mean what? can I do for my church today? How can I serve Jesus today? Come on. Let me ask you this. Maybe you're like me and, and you had a defining moment. And maybe things have kind of drifted back to the norm. So why? Why is it that so many times that we rise up above all the junk in our life and we rise up and we connect with God and, and we somehow drift back to the mundane? Why is that? I think John 10.10 10 helps to give us that answer. The thief comes except to steal, to kill, and to 
destroy. It says that I have come that they may have life And Jesus says, and that you may have it more abundantly, or that you may have it to the full. So the Bible clearly states here that Satan has come to destroy. He has come to steal. He has come to kill. But look, this is you. This is your enemy. And this is Jesus. Have you ever played tug of war? Anybody ever played tug of war? You're in the middle. Because according to the scripture here, Satan wants to steal your worship. He really, really wants to steal your praise. He wants to steal your dreams. He's pulling on your life every chance he gets. And he may blind you even with something that looks uh, good, with something that may even look righteous. But Christ is on this side. And he's saying, no, honey, don't go that away. I've got life more abundant. I've got life to the full. I've got your dreams over here. I have your hopes over here. I have peace over here. And he says, well, I've got depression. I'm pulling you over into a funk over here. And Christ says, but I'm giving you peace of mind, peace that passes all understanding. If you could roll back the heavenlies and see the plan that is against your life, you see that there is something after your dream. It's after your destiny. And how many times do you know, and you've written down, you've had that conversation with God and you said, God, I know that you have put me here for a purpose, but for some reason you feel like you keep being pulled over this way and you don't understand and you blame yourself. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Bible is very clear. Jesus said that Satan has come to pull you into the pit with him. He wants to make you believe that you are a loser, to make you believe that you'll never do anything, to make you believe that your past will haunt you and define you from here on out. And Jesus said, that's just a lie. That's That's just not the truth. Because the truth is, is that he has come to give you an abundance of salvation which is your eternal salvation, but it's also your prosperity. It's also your health. It's also the power to overcome. And we need that in our life to be able to overcome whatever obstacle has probably come against you even today. Those hurdles that that you climb every day. He wants to steal your worship. And some of you, he's really trying hard to steal your gift because Jesus told some of you that I equipped you to pray to intercede he told some of you I equipped you with a prophetic voice I equipped you to teach I equipped you to preach and Satan says that's not you you can't do that they'll laugh at you you have no education you're a farce nobody will believe you we all know what you did in the past you'll never never measure up to what you think your destiny is So he's trying to steal your worship because if he can just get you in the background and you can just be okay with a little bit, then you've taken your eyes off the prize. You've taken your eyes off of Christ or God in Christ Jesus. And he's stolen your dream. Now listen, here's just a little tool that maybe you can use in Matthew 12 and 43, and it'll help you In this situation, the Bible says, Matthew 12 and 43, it says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty. You know why it's empty? Because you got rid of that addiction. Because you got rid of that affair. Because you got rid of those bad habits. 
because you clean the house out of those poor spending habits of the poor eating habits of all that junk going on in your life. You got rid of them. Great job. You deserve to be applauded. But the Bible says that Satan, he's left. You kicked him out of your house, but he's come back and he found it clean. It's spotless, good for you. But listen to what it says, the next point. He says, when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and it's put in order. You've got your life in order. Everything seems to be right. You've followed the instructions. You've done what you were told to do. But you're right where the enemy wants you. Because the next verse says, then he goes and takes with him seven or several other spirits more wicked than himself. You ever quit smoking and then three months later you smoke twice as much as you ever did? You ever quit drinking and and you used to drink beer and you just couldn't drink beer and then a, a few months or maybe a year or so later, now you're drinking whiskey and you can't stop? Your life was in order. But now it's worse than it was. You swept everything clean. You thought you were doing everything right. Seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that man or woman is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. Listen, let me encourage you. Let me give you something tonight. It's real simple. You can't clean up your act. You have to replace it. You can't just get something out of your life and leave that void. You can't just leave it empty. You've got to replace that with something, especially if it is an addiction in your life. If you have fought that addiction, that control over your life, you can't wake up one morning and say, hey, I've kicked it. You can't do that because it ain't going to work for you. You must, you must replace it. And this is not something that's going to work over uh, three months or a year or three years. This is a new lifestyle for you. If you want your life to continue to be delivered, to continue to be set free, continue to be trekking toward your destiny, your dreams, then it is a lifestyle for you. If you all of a sudden you have an evangelistic call on your life and you just feel like you can save the world, but you're a former alcoholic, you can't go into the bars to save people. There's a lot of lost people. You don't need to be in the bar. Let somebody else feel that pull to going, yeah, but I've kicked it and I can really reach those people. Can you? Is it really uh, worth risking getting in the environment of something that you have defeated, especially too soon, but you replace whatever it is that has been in your life. You know, I would suggest to you that if you have had depression in your life and, and you finally kick that and you feel joy in your life, the way to not go back to that is to give yourself away. If you want to keep your life out of depression, then you must, you must find ways to give of yourself. If you're constantly, if you're consumed with a giving lifestyle, then when the enemy comes back, he won't find your place empty. He'll find it swept clean, but it will not be empty. It will be full of life, full of serving, full of a heart for other people. So you see what I'm saying when I mean replace that. If you've lost the relationship of someone you really uh, loved or maybe a, a, a family member and, and it is just tearing you up inside, maybe it was a marriage, maybe something along those ways, and you've lost that relationship, don't try to read a book or go to counseling and get over it. You have to replace that. Get you another relationship with a mentor. Find somebody who is wise, not somebody who's also going through a divorce or somebody who's also just lost someone and is, is going through bereavement. That's not who you get around you to help you. Find somebody who can be a strong, devout, wise man or woman in your life to help you be strengthened, to help you <clears throat> to overcome if you're continually arguing, 
if you're always fighting, if you're always angry, then you can't just stop one day and say, well, I'm just a nice person now. You've got to replace that. Find the ways inside of you to daily replace being angry with joy to replace. Being, you know, wouldn't it be nice if somebody changed your name from Saul to Paul by saying, you know, that's just an angry, angry, mad person, but no longer calling you an angry or mad person. But can you believe that person? That's the most nice, cheerful, encouraging person I've ever been around. I can be in my worst moment and be around that man or that woman and they just lift my spirits. And somebody else can come back and say, man, I knew them in the past. And if you ever went around them, if you didn't get punched, you left in a bad way, in a bad state. Am I making sense? You see how this, this attack can come against your life, but you can get it out and you can defeat this attack once and for all instead of returning you can't continually have an encounter with God if you continually fall back to the traps, to the pain, to the habits, to the things that you have encountered and endured so many months or years. You can't go back to that thing and think that you're going to have an increased encounter with God. You've just got to be aware every day. Jeff, we got to be aware that there is an attack against our praise. Satan is trying to steal your worship. <clears throat> if he can get your mind off of God and just get it on anything else, then he's won for that moment. He's won. He stole that moment from you, that opportunity for you to draw closer to God. <clears throat> I think one of the most encouraging things that I've heard repeated here in the last few weeks from several and that I see is a thread that's a consistent thread and trend throughout the Bible is that we not only have to pursue God or we get to pursue God, but God, God is pursuing you. I mean, how encouraging is it to know that the creator is actually pursuing you? The Bible says in Proverbs 8, 17, it says, I love those who love me and those who seek me early or diligently, they'll find me. Man, that, that encourages me because it makes me think, and I know this is not about works and it's not about all tools and principles. It is about a relationship, but it really makes me think if I really want to beat this thing, if I really want to encounter my destiny, if I really want to experience God on a new level every day, then maybe I should even just start first thing in the morning, early in the morning seeking God, diligently throughout the day seeking God because God said, if you'll seek me, then you will find me my God that's encouraging to know that he cares enough about us that he said if you'll just come after me you'll find me if you'll just look after me if you'll just praise me if you'll just worship me that hey you will find me and what you find on this mountaintop with me is a blessed life is a life full of joy it is a life with peace it is the ability to overcome that thing you've been battling my God is it that easy? Is it that simple just to seek God, a God that is seeking you? Second Chronicles 16, 9. Uh, you said the other night, one of my favorite scriptures, interesting, because the night that you mentioned that is about three weeks ago, the day before, I was studying that again, that very scripture. I thought, okay, God, I hear you. I know this is the right message for some of you. Second Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout this earth, yeah. searching for those whose heart is fully his so that he can support them. Think about that. God is not just some lofty, mighty old man that's sitting back. I believe he's got on his jogging shorts and he's running around and he's looking and he's trying to find somebody, he says, whose heart is fully his so that he can support you in your destiny, in your endeavors, so he can support you in your marriage. He can support you in your new job. He can support you in overcoming those problems that have come against you. He said, just look after me, give your heart totally to me and I will support you. Thank you Lord. 
I mean, it's one thing for your boss to say, you know what, I support you. It's one thing for your wife to look at you and say, you know what, I really support you. It's one thing for your mom and mine has my whole life to say, I support my God. When God looks at you and says, I fully support everything that you're doing. Keep it up, big boy. Keep it up, girl. I support everything that you're doing. Just keep going. You're doing all the right things. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise and worship in here. My God. I mean, how magnificent is it to think God is on the prowl looking to support you? Little old you? This is not just some, some lofty idea. This is just truth. This is just the word. If you believe a little bit of it, you got to believe all of it. I love Psalms 24, 3, because it says, and this sounds kind of big. It says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or stand on in his holy place? And it sounds like there's a big old God and you're this little bitty old person. He said, hey, who can come up to my mountain? But you know what I think? I would challenge you to, to study this scripture in Psalm 24, because I think... God is going, hey, who can come up here? Bet you can't do it. Come on, you can do it. Who? Who can come up to my mountain? Who can get in my holy place? Who can get in my presence? Because it's the presence where the anointing is. And the Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. The enemy cannot be in the same presence as God. And God says, oh, come on up to my mountain. Come up to where I am. If you dwell and you earnestly seek me, my God. Oh, you'll find me. Oh, I'll bring you into that holy place, that righteous place, that place I brought Moses into, that place I brought, I brought all of the saints into.